Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. I hope you're having an excellent day. Today we're going to talk about nucleophilicity, and this is going to be the start of a series of lectures on reactions in organic chemistry, which is my personal favorite area. But before we get into that, let's go over the practice problems I assigned last time. So I wanted you to decide whether several compounds were chiral or achiral. So here, here in this first example, we have this quaternary ammonium salt. And you see if you rotate this around and get the opposite and antimer, they're actually the same compound. So these aren't chiral, these are meso compounds, they're the same compound. So they're achiral. In the next example, we have the cyclohexane derivative, and the same thing's true. If you just rotate this around 180 degrees, you get the exact same compound. Uh, so these are the same, they're meso. In the third problem, we have this chiral sulfoxide. And so this chiral sulfoxide has a methyl group sticking up. If we look at its mirror image and we have the methyl group sticking down, there's no way that we can rotate this enantiomer to get the other enantiomer. And for sulfoxides, inversion doesn't occur. And so these are actually chiral enantiomers of one another. In the case of the second one, if we'd had an additional functional group sticking off in the ortho or para position, we actually would have chiral compounds. So this motif, which is called a tetrahydrofuran, which is fused to a benzene ring, this actually could be a chiral motif if there's any other substituents. And the same would be true about this methyl group on this, um, this uh, six-membered ring with a nitrogen. Okay, so... Uh, I wanted to introduce a couple of common reagents as we're starting to move into synthesis. We're not going to encounter these reagents today, but they'll be good for you to be aware of moving forward. So the first one is uh, DMAP, 4-dimethylaminopyridine. This is commonly used as a nucleophilic catalyst. As we'll see in the synthesis of esters and amides in the future, DMAP is quite common. Uh, another interesting one is MCPBA, metachloroperbenzoic acid. This is used as a very electrophilic oxygen source. The reason it's electrophilic is this hydrogen can actually hydrogen bond to the carbonyl of this per acid, uh, which makes it very uh, uh, electrophilic at the oxygen. Uh, one other interesting compound is tosyl chloride. So similar to toluene sulfonic acid, tosic acid, which we talked about last time, we can have tosyl chloride or tosyl chloride. Uh, and what this can be used for, useful for is for the synthesis of tosylates. And so this can react with alcohols and make alcohols into a good leaving group. And you might be wondering, what on earth is a leaving group? And we're gonna to get to that later today. So, nucleophilicity. So when you're doing nucleophilic reactions, we typically use polar aprotic solvents in organic synthesis. And so in your textbooks, uh, it might often say, if you wanna do substitution reactions, you should use polar protic solvents but practically speaking, most of the time in most organic transformations, um, you'll be using polar solvents such as acetonitrile, dimethylformamide, DMSO, HMPA, and once in a while you'll see ethanol or water used. But more often than not, DMF and DMSO are probably the most common solvents to use. Um, acetonitrile is quite commonly used, but it's kind of borderline polar, so it depends on what we're trying to do with it. So DMF is NN dimethylformamide. DMSO is dimethyl sulfoxide, and HMPA is hexamethyl phosphoramide. Um, HMPA is fairly toxic, so it doesn't get used very much, but DMSO and DMF are quite commonly used. We typically avoid using DMSO if possible because it has a very high boiling point, and as chemists, we like to remove our solvent when we're working with them. Same with DMF. DMF has a boiling point around 150. Um, the nice thing about DMSO, though, is it's miscible with most solvents, such as water, um, but it isn't miscible with diethyl ether. So if you ever have an organic compound, you can extract into ether with DMSO. Um, so those are three common polar solvents. Now, in recent years, uh, especially in the research community, there's been a wide movement towards the use of polar protic fluorinated alcohols. And so hexafluoroisopropanol is a rising star in the organic synthesis world. And it's specifically because it's so polar, but it's such a poor nucleophile. So it's a really great solvent. You can dissolve almost anything in it. Um, it also has a very low boiling point, so it's easy to remove the majority of it. Um, but the last bit that remains forms really strong hydrogen bonds, so it's hard to remove uh, every last drop of it. 
The other thing is, uh, while it's very uh, polar and it's a good hydrogen bond donor, that OH is still nowhere near as acidic as a carboxylic acid. So this is a very, very weak acid. Um, and so it can be useful for synthetic transformations because it's a good solvent and it can facilitate substitution reactions of various sorts. Um, trifluoroethanol is also quite good, but I would still say hexafluoroisopropanol has seen more use in recent years. So even if your textbooks don't discuss this one, it's a really useful solvent to be aware of, especially if you're doing research. So um, to get into nucleophilic substitution, we're going to start with a really basic SN2 reaction. Uh, in later videos, I'll get more into the differences between SN1, SN2, E1, and E2, as well as other substitution type reactions. Um, but for now, I'm just going to show a simple example. So in organic chemistry, we look at electrons. That's all we look at. We, we talk about protons in terms of like a hydrogen moving here or there. We don't really talk about neutrons. That kind of is the realm of physics, nuclear physics. So we're really looking at electrons, where they are and where they're going. And so wherever the electrons are starting is where your arrows need to start. So if something's positive, it's receiving electrons. An arrow should arrive at a positive charge or a partially positive charge. And so in this case, we have iodide, I minus. It's going to donate its electron density to this carbon of bromoethane. And in doing so, the bromide leaves as a leaving group or a nucleophage. So we have the loss of bromide and the formation of iodoethane. So this is an SN2 reaction. This is a substitution reaction of a primary alkyl bromide. Um, the technical name for this reaction is a halogen exchange or a Finkelstein reaction. Um, and so if we wanted to draw this reaction, like in a procedure or a scheme, uh, we would draw it like this. Starting with bromoethane, we have sodium iodide and acetone. We reacted at room temperature for 18 hours, and that affords us with our product. And so when you have a reaction uh, diagram like this, we have our reactant, we have any reagents. Sometimes we have multiple reactants or reagents, so you could move the sodium iodide to the left side if you'd like. We typically put the solvent above the arrow, but it can go beneath the arrow as well. Um, we then have our product, and we list the amount of time and temperature. Uh, so room temperature is acceptable because most of the time we're not checking the temperature in the room every single time, and the room can have various different temperatures, but it's kind of assumed that usually you're working in a lab somewhere between 19 and 21 degrees, so that the assumption is it's about 20 degrees. Sometimes people include concentration in acetone um, or whatever solvent they're using for a reaction. Uh, in this case, if you're curious, the reason acetone is used is sodium iodide is highly soluble in acetone, whereas sodium bromide, which would be the byproduct, is not. The sodium bromide precipitates as the reaction goes, and using Le Chatelier's principle, we're able to drive this reaction to completion quite well. So iodide is a good nucleophile. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about terminology. So a nucleophile is something with electrons. It possesses electrons, and it's usually willing to give them up and donate them. Uh, if it isn't willing to donate them, it would be a poor nucleophile, or it wouldn't be very nucleophilic. An electrophile is something that either has a positive charge or it's willing to become more negative, so it's willing to accept electrons. And so, uh, for example, in the case that we just looked at, iodide would be our nucleophile, bromoethane would be our electrophile. Um, we also have the electrophilic center, which is the center that's being attacked by the nucleophile, and we also have the leaving group, which is the nucleophage. Most of the time, people just call this a leaving group. Uh, they only will call it a nucleophage if you're trying to flex. So some things to consider. Um, when you're doing chemistry, solvents aren't always inert. You know, we need to dissolve our reagents together so that they can interact, uh, but sometimes the solvents could be competing electrophiles or nucleophiles. So it's important to consider what's going into a reaction and what purpose do they serve. And so the choice of a solvent for a given reaction is really important. And this can affect uh, what products you form, how pure the product that you form is, how high the conversion of starting material to product is, because not all reactions go all the way to completion. Um, and so it's, it's a really important consideration. You can't just pick whatever solvent you have on the shelf and assume it's going to work. You either need literature precedent or good theoretical understanding to inform your choices of solvent, both for theoretical reactions as well as actual reactions. Um, some other things to consider. Uh, so in combinations of nucleophiles and electrophiles, you need to have a nucleophile with an oomph, oomph to get the reaction going with a given electrophile. Usually in organic chemistry, we have either a really strong nucleophile or a really strong electrophile with a 
with a weak electrophile or a weak nucleophile. So one strong, one weak. Um, if you try and combine a really weak electrophile and a really weak nucleophile, the kinetics to form the desired product will be so slow that the reaction won't occur to any meaningful rate. Sometimes you can help that by heating the reaction or making it more concentrated or adding a massive excess of one of the reagents. Um, but sometimes if a reaction is slow enough, it just really won't work. Now, you might be tempted to combine uh, reactions of strong electrophiles with strong nucleophiles. Um, the problem with this, though, is it can be quite exothermic. Sometimes if these reactions release gases, it can cause a danger. It could be a risk of explosions. Um, and so a solution to that would be do these reactions really dilute, slowly add in some of the reagents, cool them down to really low temperatures, and then maybe it's possible to do uh, chemistry uh, with those reagents. And so generally we have reagents with a lot of potential energy and they're trying to get to a you know lower, more stable product. And so uh, we have to be thoughtful about what we're choosing and why and whether or not it's overkill. So when I'm talking about a good or a bad nucleophile, a strong or a weak nucleophile, this is entirely relative. So it's relative to something else. So this great researcher named Mayer and his co-workers, they developed a nucleophilicity scale, which is a logarithmic scale, which informs you about the relative nucleophilicity of various nucleophiles. Um, it also relies on the established kinetic electrophilicity of various electrophiles. Now, the N parameters are developed by the attack of these nucleophiles on a carbocation. So something like this oxygen attacks a uh, positive charge, and they can measure how fast that is with various different nucleophiles. They can then establish trends and assign uh, an electrophilicity value for the electrophile. And so they've done this with several electrophiles and many, many nucleophiles. And so they have a database which you can go see if you're curious about the relative nucleophilicity of some various uh, nucleophiles. I'll also show in a couple slides uh, a great chart that a co-worker of mine put together. So if we look at solvents, earlier I was saying that hexafluoroisopropanol is a great polar solvent and it isn't very nucleophilic. So here we look at HFIP, it's got an end parameter of about minus two. So that's a very, very poor nucleophile, one of the poorest nucleophiles. If we look at terbutanol, we have an N of about five. And for isopropanol, we have an N of about seven. So this is, you know, somewhere between 10 and 100 times more nucleophilic than terbutanol. Similarly for ethanol, it has an N of about seven. So this is only slightly more nucleophilic than isopropanol. But because these are logarithmic scales, a slight increase is actually a big difference. Now, if we're going to compare hexafluoroisopropanol to isopropanol, we have about nine orders of magnitude difference. And so that means that isopropanol is about a billion times more reactive than hexafluoroisopropanol. So if you're doing a reaction in isopropanol, for example, and you found that the isopropanol was reacting with your compounds, um, if you change the solvent over to hexafluoroisopropanol, you'll probably get somewhat similar reactivity, but with none of the side reaction that's undesired. So fluorinated alcohols are a great choice for solvents. Um, even if you compare to the end parameters of DMSO and DMF, like they're quite a bit higher than these are. So uh, HFIP, great solvent, very poor nucleophile. So here is the chart I was mentioning earlier. Um, this is a really good chart to give you an idea about relative reactivity. So if you have an electrophile and you know it reacts with one of these nucleophiles at a given area, you could guess whether or not another one of these nucleophiles would react. So iodide isn't listed on here as it hasn't been experimentally determined and reported in this database. Um, but we know iodide is a good nucleophile. And so some other functional groups here, some of these other nucleophiles would also be able to substitute uh, alkyl bromides. And as you learn some of these reactions, uh, it'll be intuitive to you why they work if you refer back to nucleophilicity parameters. While we're talking about SN2 reactions at the moment, substitution reactions of alkyl halides, for instance, these parameters are all SN1 derived, but they tend to be applicable still for SN2 reactions. Um, unless there's like a really big steric factor of a leaving group or a nucleophile. So this is just kind of a good chart to refer back to. If uh, there's an interest in providing a link to this in the description, if someone leaves a comment, I'll put a Google Drive link to this if you're interested. So for a practice problem, I thought it would be useful to assign a problem like this. So identify the nucleophile and the electrophile in the following reaction. Um, you should also identify on the electrophile which center is the electrophilic center and which group is the nucleophage, aka leaving group. Another practice problem is to draw the product of this corresponding reaction. So here we have 
2 bromoethyl benzene. We react this with sodium cyanide and DMF at room temperature for 18 hours. Um, and so it would be good to identify the product as well as any byproducts that are formed. Um, in addition, identify which one of these is the reagent and which one of these is the solvent in the reaction. And so with that, uh, I hope this has been an entertaining and informative lecture for you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them in the comments. And if you have any suggestions about how you think this series could be done better, I'd be happy to hear them in the comments. And with that, I hope you have a great day. Thank you for listening.